In 2017, Christopher Clements sat down with special agents with the FBI. He was currently here at the Pima County Jail awaiting trial on burglary charges, charges he wanted dropped. I asked U.S. Customs and Border Patrol exactly how many people had been processed here at this facility. I also asked for their ages and how long they stayed here before being transferred. They said, were you surprised by that? Did you have any expectations going into today? Had you hoped to hear an apology, some sort of admission? And she said she would not waste another breath on Clarence Dixon. Here's a look at the fires burning across our state. This is the one that we're watching closely tonight. The San Rafael fire burning near Patagonia. It's now burned more than 11,600 acres. We had rain earlier this week, but how much of a difference is it going to make for our fire situation? This is something Chief Meteorologist Aaron Christensen has been tracking. What can you tell us? It's not unusual to see volunteers in a major watch like this picking up trash after a monsoon, but something they can't pick up this. The KULD investigates team obtained this portable readiness audit performed by the TUSD operations department earlier this year. The Pima County attorney took office during a pandemic and at the start of a record breaking year for homicides. Now a year into her job, I sat down one on one with Laura Conover to go over some of last year's biggest moments and what lies ahead in 2022. Some people I spoke with are banner employees. Others are community members who heard about the mandate and then joined in today's protest to show their support for employees who choose not to be vaccinated. She just shared with us that the state has now written a letter to FEMA saying that it's giving Pima County the authority to work independently with FEMA to create a federal vaccination site here in Pima County. What is your response to that? <laughs> So you're making my day. You should be making the day of everybody that has any interest in improving the health of Pima County. I am Shaylee Sanders with KLD News 13. And I have an update on an investigation I have followed for years. A federal judge has said that's it. They threw out the settlement and now both of these parties are going to court. We did hear from the director of the ADCRR this week. He testified and he said these inmates have better health care than he does. In just the first five months of this fiscal year, the department has spent $1,159,641 in jail overtime. The moon is an average of 238,855 miles away from Earth. So the idea of lunar mining sounds, well, a bit tricky. That's up more than 11% from last year. The average sales price for a single family home in Tucson is about $405,000, up nearly 34%. We even have an eight ball. Are we going to get a really big donation in about 30 seconds? Yes. Okay, let's bring in Sandy Nelson, who is the owner of Arizona Blinds and Supply. Take a look at this donation. AAA says the average price for gas here in Arizona is $4.69 a gallon, tying with the record set on March 29th. Now in Tucson, we are a little bit lower at $4.47. The sentence is probation for an Arizona couple who lost their two children and a niece after driving through dangerous floodwaters. Christopher Clements, the man charged in the murders of two young Tucson girls, is set to face trial this summer. KLD News 13 produced an eight-episode podcast on the crimes called Disappeared in the Desert. It looks at how detectives investigating the deaths of Isabel Celis and Maribel Gonzalez zeroed in on Clements and the evidence to be presented at trial. Today, KOLD was honored to receive a regional Edward R. Murrow Award for our work on this series. I'm not doing this to be a good Samaritan, I'll be honest. It's a case that gripped the nation, and tonight our KOLD investigates team has never before seen video of the man accused of kidnapping and killing two Tucson girls. Now, 39-year-old Christopher Clements is facing 22 felony charges, including two counts of first-degree murder. His first trial is set in just a few weeks. He's accused of killing six-year-old Isabel Celis in 2012 and 13-year-old Maribel Gonzalez in 2014. Their bodies were found just feet apart from each other in rural Pima County. So how did law enforcement make this discovery? KOLD News 13 investigative reporter Shaley Sanders joins us now with what these new videos reveal. In 2017, Christopher Clement sat down with special agents with the FBI. He was currently here at the Pima County Jail awaiting trial on burglary charges, charges he wanted dropped. In 2018, KLD obtained these transcripts of conversations Clements had with the FBI. And tonight, for the first time, we're seeing the video. 
So you probably know why we're here to talk to your girlfriend, I guess, Melissa? Fiance. Fiance, all right. This is video from February 10th, 2017 of Christopher Clements being questioned by the FBI. We're going to check it out, you know, and I want to see if... Uh, I'm glad you guys have done more things to it. According to their exchange in this interview, Clements had his fiance contact the FBI and tell them he knew where to find six-year-old Isabel Sellis, the little girl who went missing from her east side home five years earlier in April 2012. I'm not doing this to be a good Samaritan, I'll be honest. Well, yeah. Yeah. I was involved with some people. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how I know. Clements wanted to strike a deal. I think the information that I have is a lot more valuable than a conviction or me staying in here. In exchange for information about Celis' location, Clements wanted his Pima County burglary charges dropped and his vehicle that was being held by law enforcement released to his fiance. Are you saying that she might still be alive? Have you heard that? I'm saying I'm not going to tell you the answer to that question. I'm, I know it. What purpose did you have for keeping her alive? You'd have to ask the people that did it. I don't know. I don't know what the purpose would be to killing a six-year-old. Despite knowing her location, he told agents repeatedly that he was not directly responsible for her disappearance. I didn't do this. Okay, how about I didn't have any direct involvement with her kidnapping. If you gave us where she's at, would we be able to go and scoop her up this afternoon? Could we do that? Is that possible? With the information that yeah. I have, yes. Right. You could. Absolutely. Without a doubt. You could. No. All right. Yeah, you could have her within 12 hours. 12 hours? It would take us that long? <laughs> I said within 12 hours. If Clements knew where Celis was for five years, why did he stay quiet? He said he didn't want to put his own family in danger by speaking to law enforcement. I'm not in here because I'm a good Samaritan. I'm not in here because I care so much about mm -hmm. the, the sanctity and morality of society. Mm -hmm. I can really give a What I care about is my family. Right. Period. As the agents began to construct a deal, Clements' demands expanded to include full immunity, so nothing he said about Isabel could be used against him. I, I mean, know. you're changing your tune. You're saying you're not directly... I'm not, but I've never changed my tune. I've if always said that I want to cover my... You're not directly 100%. involved. It doesn't matter if I was or wasn't. I told you I'm not directly involved. I said that I'm not directly involved. But I want the language on there to reflect that no matter what you guys' opinion is, whether or not I'm directly involved, it doesn't matter. It can't be used against me. The agents worked with the Pima County attorney to get Clements' burglary charges dropped and his car released. But by February 28th, immunity still wasn't on the table, and agents weren't any closer to finding Isabel's location. I would have given you guys where she's at, and it wouldn't have been just bogus bull it would have been the truth and there would have been closure to this case and I'm not 99% sure about that I'm 100% sure about it you guys would have as a bonus <laughs> you guys would have found out about something else too by can default you, can you tell me what that is no because if I told you that then you guys would know exactly what direction to go but by March 2nd, despite not having full immunity, Clements gave agents a location. As far as I understand, this is the location. Avra Valley and Trico Road. Kind of familiar with that area. It's pretty remote. I ask, are we talking now about a grave site versus a location where she's alive? As far as I understand, she's not. I... She's not alive. As far as I understand, I mean, last time we talked to him, he said he saw, he knew firsthand, and he did say she was alive. I don't know anything about When I walked possible. out, I, I was saying okay. she's not. Is it a burial site or just a, a place where a body was dumped? What I know is that's where. 
That's 100%. That's the area. Yeah, you said when we find the location, it's going to tell us a whole bunch more. I can't see where a location in the middle of the desert is going to tell us anything. Can I answer that? No. According to these transcripts, we know what happened after that conversation. Clements led agents to the middle of the desert, to that remote area near Trico Road and Avra Valley Road. Not too far from where the dirt road forks, law enforcement found human remains under a mesquite tree. All of this was kept from the public until March 31st, 2017, when then Tucson Police Chief Chris Magnus made the devastating announcement. Unfortunately, the results of this DNA analysis did confirm that the remains were those of Isabel Salas. This is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the conversations Clements had with the FBI. Coming up tomorrow night, we'll tell you about the other deal he tried to make with investigators. Plus, you can hear who Clements claims was involved with the death of Isabel Sellis on a new episode of our podcast, Disappeared in the Desert, out tomorrow. It's available on SoundCloud, Apple and Google Podcast, and Spotify. You can subscribe to get notified of new episodes. Shaylee Sanders, KOLD, Investigates. We're in a really bad staffing situation inside of the jail. Tom Frazier is a sergeant in the Corrections Bureau for Pima County. I've uh, been there for almost 18 and a half years. He's also the president of the Pima Corrections Association, a union that says staffing levels are now a critical concern. We're already exhibiting just vast amounts of overtime, rolling lockdowns. That's not how we were designed to run. It's not good direct supervision. Like all Pima County employees working with vulnerable populations, corrections officers must be vaccinated by December 31st. According to the latest numbers from the Pima County Sheriff's Department, out of the 425 uniformed corrections officers, 158 have yet to be vaccinated. January 1 is a, is a scary date. I want the taxpayers to know that we cannot provide the level of care for these people within our walls, for our staff, if this mandate goes through. We cannot afford to lose 10 more officers, let alone 200. We're not being fiscally responsible to the taxpayers. We're not being morally responsible to the employees and the incarcerated individuals under our charge. Corrections Officer and Vice Chairman of the Sheriff's Labor Association, Carlos Delgado, says he's been with the county for about 15 years. The point of this mandate was supposedly to put inmates less at risk. But if the mandate were to take effect today and we lose that many officers, the inmates would be put in a higher danger because we would not have the bodies to give them the proper care that they're entitled to, that they deserve. And the citizens of Pima County need to uh, be fully aware of that. These officers say the staffing shortages are affecting just how much time inmates can spend outside of their cells. So now with the staffing shortage, are they getting the same amount of day room time or, or no? No, with rolling lockdowns, what we're doing is we have three main facilities. What we're having to do on certain days because of staff shortages is leave, say, the tower facility on lockdown, the inmates um, in that that building do not come out to day room at the normal times so that we can run day rooms in the other two buildings. And these officers say they've seen a spike in overtime and that's before the potential loss of nearly 200 officers due to the vaccine mandate. We don't have the necessary bodies to reach minimum staffing on a daily basis, which means that officers from the prior shift are being forced to stay for double shifts. That's anywhere between between 16 hours and 18 hours, 18 hours if they get forced onto our overnight shift, which is a 10 hour shift. And this is happening two, three, and in, in some cases, four times a week. Pima County Sheriff Chris Nano says he's aware of the overtime numbers and the staffing levels. If I lost 158 bodies anywhere in this agency, would that be a challenge? Absolutely. We don't, we don't want to lose anybody. They're very valuable to us. They're part of this family and part of this organization. But the decisions I have to make aren't just based on, on popularity contest. Nano says the vaccine mandate isn't going anywhere. We lost three inmates this last year to COVID. I, I have to do everything I can to prevent that and not have mandating vaccines isn't doing everything I can. 
I requested the overtime numbers for the Pima County Sheriff's Department and keep in mind Sheriff Nanos took office in January of this year. This fiscal year, the department budgeted $805,105 in overtime at the jail. In just the first five months of this fiscal year, the department has spent $1,159,641 in jail overtime. Despite being over budget when it comes to jail overtime, Sheriff Nanos tells me overall the department is projected to come in under budget by about half a million dollars. And Nano says the overtime isn't coming from staffing shortages, but staff calling out sick. Do you think if half of your COs have to leave because they refuse to be vaccinated, though, that that will significantly increase the overtime? No. I actually think overtime will be reduced because we actually have the bigger workforce over there, the greater workforce that really just wants to do the job. They don't call in sick. We learned that before we came here of a plan where they were on the 12 hour shifts, one squad would tell the other squad, we'll call in sick next week so you guys get the overtime and then you call in the following week and we get overtime. While he says losing roughly half of his corrections officers would be a shame, it's a challenge Nano says he's confident the department could overcome. It may help improve morale, not decrease morale. There are a number of people over there who I have heard from and my command teams have heard from that they're tired of the nonsense and the games being played by these two associations.